Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? I'm doing good. I got tortured in my rehab a couple of hours ago. I, you know, the, I got um, I got punished for the things that I don't do right. You know, that's that's one thing when you're doing rehab. Uh, it's it's a way of being punished for whatever you've done wrong. A little bit of what you've done wrong because <laughs> when they manipulate your, in this case, my knee, and they take it and they have to bend it in a way that it doesn't want to bend anymore. It, um, you know, it hurts. <laughs> and, and, of course, you're going to keep your mouth shut. You're not going to do what you feel like doing, which is to scream and say, are you out of your effing mind <laughs> doing, doing that to my leg? Are you crazy? But, you know, and then when you when you got that attitude that you can't let anybody know how you feel, when they say, how's it feel? Mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How's it feel? Let me do it to you and see how it feels. <laughs> after, you know, after I tear your ligaments off. But um, but I'm I'm fortunate. I have good people working with me, doing a rehab, making some progress. And also, more important than that, uh, today was the first day of a trial that my daughter is is uh, doing down in Manhattan in her law firm. And she she gave the opening statement in the trial today. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal for me. I'm just proud of her, for proud of all my children and my grandchildren. But um proud of my son, proud of her. But she's she's doing good. I, I texted her, she was at a lunch break and she had just finished cross examining a witness and then they took a lunch break for the court and then it, she's gonna go back to um to cross examining him, and I was gonna say, but I decided not to. I was gonna say a line from my cousin Vinny when Joe <laughs> Pesci was a lawyer. You know, yeah. when when you're done with the cross examination, I was gonna just say, um, tell the judge I'm true with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm true with this one. You remember that, Sam? I'm, yeah, of I'm, course. I'm, I'm I'm true with this one, but no, that would be not a good thing to be saying to a judge uh, in a jury, especially a judge that you want to be uh, actually in favor of things that you do, not against you. So, But anyway, I'm very proud of her. I just want to mention that. I, I that Out of the blue, I wasn't even thinking I was going to mention it. And um, it looks like I'm going to be... I don't know if I told you and uh, Rob off camera about this. I don't even remember. But it looks like I'm going back to um, Saudi Arabia with the good people over there and the face of boxing, Turkey al uh and the Fury people that run you know, run a lot of the the logistics and setting things up over there for the big fights. Uh, May 18th for the Fury Usyk fight. Me and my son will be going back. Uh, we just got confirmation of it the other day. So we'll be going back for that and I'm supposed to actually, they had asked me to go to the June 1st. Uh, I'm not sure if we're still doing that. I, I would assume we probably are. Obviously, that was supposed to be Bevo and Better Beef, but now it's Bevo and Zinyat, who's undefeated, an undefeated fighter. I forget what his record is. He's 20-something old, and Bevo will be fighting him now instead of uh, Better Beef. And then on the undercard, you can't really call it an undercard because these cards that Turkey al Sheikh puts together are, are not the normal undercards. Every one of their undercards could be a main event uh, anywhere else. So you have the five versus five. You have Eddie Hearns' team uh, versus Frank Warren's team. And uh, you you got... It's, it's quite a lineup. I, I don't have it in front of me, but... I know that you have Deontay Wilder, and um, and I believe Wiley, right? A, I, I believe he's is he fighting Wiley? I believe he's fighting Wiley. The um, June first is uh, the main event is Deontay Wilder and Zaili Zhang. Yeah, Bevel yeah. Zai, versus Zai Zanad, Daniel Dubois against Philip Philip Herg, Herg, Hergovich. 
uh, Raymond Ford, Nick Ball at featherweight, and then a couple of other low, uh, fights, early fights. Let me I correct myself familiar. now instead of next week before the fans have to correct me. I was saying Wiley. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't meaning the great uh, UFC female fighter. I meant to say um, uh, Zhang. Zhili. Zhili Zhang. Zhili Zhang. Zhang, uh, who just who just lost a, a fight to Joseph Parker uh, over there in Saudi Arabia. I was there ringside for that fight, and Joseph Parker did a great job. So this is a really interesting card, and that's an interesting fight. You know, uh, Wilder to see how much each guy has left. I mean, Wilder the great puncher, you know, but he lost to Parker too, and uh, you know you wonder. How much does he have left? Uh, you know, he's always going to have that power in the right hand. But against Parker, it wasn't enough. Uh, Parker had a great game plan, fight plan, and, you know, did a tremendous job disarming him. But it wasn't one of, it wasn't one of, uh, of, uh, of his best, Wilder's best performances, uh, Really, but again, a lot of that had to do with Parker and, and how he went about disarming him. But uh, Zhang is coming off that loss to Parker. He's a huge monster of a, of a man. What is he, like six seven? Uh, he's a southpaw on top of it, but he's like six seven, six eight, close to 300 pounds. So uh, he's, you know, he's big, like, like Fury. Big, giant mountain of a man. It, it'll be a really interesting fight. And the whole card will be interesting. So anyway, I'm going over there with my son, Teddy. Uh, so I'll be gone for a little while uh, while I'm over there. And hopefully, you know, hopefully everything will go well there. And we, let's jump, I guess, right into uh, Canelo and Magia. Kind of went the way that we caught it last week. You know, I said Canelo would win. The only difference, I thought Canelo would stop him late or had a chance to stop him late. But uh, definitely had Canelo winning the fight. Yeah, we played around a little bit with Mike Bookie saying we would put a small bet on McGee to to win a decision, getting back $700 uh, for $100. But I didn't want to lay uh, 600 on Canelo, but I made it very definitive in my prediction that Canelo would win the fight in my estimation. But instead, we we were thinking about a uh, a stoppage, which almost happened. You know, Canelo dropped him in the fourth, beautifully set up punch. You know, he he used the left hook to kind of distract him, and then threw the right uppercut. Goes to show you what a great chin McGee has getting up from that because he never saw that punch. It was a yeah. clean, clean punch. Though, like I said, he was distracted by the left hook, which was really a beautiful setup by, by Canelo. Uh, let's get into the fight. I mean, look, it, it went the way I thought it would go, where they picked, and and I'm not. I don't want the fans right away to say I'm not giving him his due. So let me let me start with this. Canelo looked good. He did what he had to do. He fought a real nice, solid veteran fight. It was, he treated, and I always give credit. You know, I don't take words or thoughts from other people. If I, if I use it, I'll credit them. Uh, usually my thoughts are original. They're my own. I've been around long enough to have my own damn thoughts. But uh, I... I have to say, I did a pro box show live right after the fight with Pauli Malinacci, um and with Chris Algieri. And Chris Algieri hit it on the button the way he described it. He said that for the whole build up the fight, Canelo treated Munguia like his little brother. And that's that came really came to fruition. And that's the best way I can describe it is what Chris said, that it was kind of like fighting your little brother. No matter how tough your little brother is, you know you're going to beat him. You know he's your little brother. You ain't letting him win. And even 
when the little brother Mangia came out, very game, came out of the, came out of the, you know, from the jump, he came out of the blocks really hot, really fast. I think he caught Colano by surprise a little bit. A little bit like Haney was caught by surprise a couple of weeks ago against Garcia, you know, where the same thing. Nobody gave Garcia a chance. Nobody was thinking that he had a chance. And then he comes out of the blocks, you know, and I know there's another part to that now with the drug testing we're going to have to touch on later. Uh, you'll bring me back to that later. But the bottom line is Garcia came out fast. I don't think Haney was mentally prepared uh, for that being that all he had heard about was how you know, he wouldn't be ready, he wasn't ready, he was overweight, all the other things. So nobody really gave McGee a chance. And I don't think Canelo in his mind gave him much of a chance. So I think he was caught a little bit storm. The storm, that the storm of McGee coming out so fast, I think it caught McGee, Canelo by surprise a little bit. And um, But he weathered the storm well. He... he First of all, one of the things I pointed out last week that would give him a big edge is that his defense is better. And he covers up, he blocks really well, and he looks for counters, he looks for spots. And I also said his technique's a little better, where his punches are more succinct, his punches are shorter, the, you know, they're sharper. The technique is a little tighter, a little better than McGee's. And I also said McGee's a work in progress. Even though he's had 43, now 44 fights, he's still he's still developing. You know, he's a young kid, he's 27, he's still getting better. And I also said that Canelo and his people picked Mangia for a reason. They saw all these things. They saw that he is aggressive, that makes himself available for a guy who's a good puncher, an accurate puncher like Canelo, to find him, and that he still was a work in progress. That the way I said it, I think McGee is still was when he took this fight, he was probably still a year shy of being fully ready. And and I'm saying that way he's improving. Where I like the way McGee is improving. And he fought a hell of a fight. But I think that Canelo understood and his people that they were getting him at the right time. They were getting a guy that would be in front of him. Yeah, game guy. Yeah, guy who could punch a little bit. Yeah, a guy who throws a lot of punches. But a guy that they could hit. A guy that at the end of the day, they could do what they needed to do with at this point in Canelo's career. Canelo is a nice, accurate, good puncher, good, solid fighter, really good, solid fighter, and a good counter puncher. And McGee was perfect for that. And again, McGee won the first three rounds. I don't know what the official score they had on TV was watching that he gave the second round to... Canelo, I, the first three rounds, I, I'm telling you, I, I don't care. Uh, I, I mean, you you could come out of cataract surgery and, and you still would know that Munguia won those first three rounds. And and for them, for, for that official judge to have one of those rounds for Canelo and then he gave no rounds later on. Are you kidding me? I'm jumping around right now. But are you kidding me, Ken? Later in the fight, McGee was coming back. He was, he was, he was, you know, he was out working Canelo. He was landing some. He had his moments late in that fight. Canelo won a fight, and he had a great performance, and he looked good. And and I hats off to him. Congratulations, Canelo. Congratulations to all the fans. You did a terrific job. You look really good. But even the maniac, even the most crazy fans and the most loyal fans to Canelo, you have to admit that that official score on TV when he had nothing but all rounds all the way across the board after the first and third, I think those are the only ones I think that he gave to McGee. There's something wrong. You're going to tell me that you're not going to give McGee any of the, the 8th, the ninth, the, the, you know, Canelo won the 12th round, uh, but, and he finished good. But 
the eighth, the ninth, the tenth. I, I don't remember exactly, but none of those late rounds you're going to give to McGee. You're not going to give him one, two. I mean, give the fight again. Give it to Canel. He won it. No doubt. He won it. How'd he win it? He won it the old-fashioned professional scoring way. Whoever lands the cleaner, more effective punches wins the fight, wins the rounds. And that's what he did. He landed the cleaner, more effective punches. McGee outworked him. And I'm tired of these punch numbers sometimes. I'm not trying to stop anyone from a cottage industry and and making money doing that. I'm not. They've been doing it for years, 100 years. God bless them. You know, they put their kids through college. They they paint their houses off with it. God bless them. A good idea to come up with another bell and whistle for boxing. The punch number. But please, don't keep quoting these numbers as, as though they're infallible as though that you know that's what you got to go by that don't worry just look at the numbers you know who won please stop that these numbers are not always accurate sometimes they're not even close to being accurate i know it's a nice little bell and whistle I know it's a nice little gadget that you say, oh, this guy's this busy, this guy that, this guy's throwing this many body parts, this guy's throwing this many jets. But overall, the numbers, you think that a human being with stuff going on like this real quick in the midst of a, 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 you know, a barnstorm of a fight, in the midst of a firefight, you think that they're counting those punches accurately? Really? Would you let them be your accountant? That's all I have to say. <laughs> Would you? Sam says no. I say no too. Uh, with with that system, your accountant's going to be adding up all the deductions and everything else that he's got to add up for you to pay the lowest tax possible. He's going to be doing it in the middle of a fight, in the middle of two guys throwing punches at him, left and right and right and left, and all kinds of action, blood, everything, all kinds of stuff going on. And you're going to go by those, your accountant's numbers? No, you're not. No, you're not. And I ain't going by them either, not to that extent. So anyway, I had to throw that because nobody else has to, you know what, to say it, whatever. I don't know, or whatever. They, uh, Everyone wants to be friends with everybody. Nobody wants to. Um, I just say what I feel. I say what I see from experience. I know that there's no way that that can be depended on to the point that sometimes these announcers depend on or seem, seem, depend on your eyes, depend on what you're watching in a fight, depend on that. Anyway, Canelo, great performance. Uh, But when I point out the things I point out, again, to some of the rapid fans out there will say, oh, you're knocking him, you can't give him his due. No, I'm giving him his due. I'm giving it to him. I, I, like on a silver platter it can't be clearer but Canelo has at this point in his career has slowed down <laughs> he's not and, and in some ways he's gotten better like a fine wine and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that because he doesn't waste anything he only throws what he can land you know he doesn't throw extra he's more conservative he's more patient he's he's his defense is better than it was early in his career in some ways. In some ways. Um, like I said, he's a much more <laughs> patient guy, uh, looking to place his shots, make them all count. But he's not as busy as he was, where he would put more punches together. He's, his output isn't as fast. His motor doesn't run as fast. And he's older. My God, he's been around since he's, what, turned pro when he was 15, 16 years old? He's older now. So, yeah, it makes sense. He has slowed down. He has slowed down um, to a more conservative pace. Uh, but it, it served him in this fight because you had the other guy going 100 miles an hour, especially coming out of the box, really too fast. He came out a little too He won the first three rounds. I made a note. In the second round, when he came out fast, Ken, I said, he's going to get caught. He's throwing too many, and, and he's staying in front. He's having success. He's backing up Canelo. He's catching him by surprise a little bit, but Canelo's not getting caught too many clean. He's covering. He's blocking. He's biding his time. <laughs> Canelo knew 
that sooner or later he would find what he was looking to find, what he knew he would find when he made this fight. The guy being in front of him where he could catch him with a counter, where he would make himself too available. And that's the note I made to myself. Yeah, I love his attitude. I love his, that he's going out there, he's backing up Canelo. He's going out there to win. He's going out there taking charge. He's going out there being a boss. But for me, I would have preferred it doing it at a distance. Where you do it in spots, get out. Do it in spots, move to the side. Don't stay there doing it and get drunk, which is success. Because remember, you got a good counterpuncher and experience. And that word experience, that was the key to this fight. The greatest advantage Canelo had, and there's a million things here. He's shorter puncher, good puncher. He's got a great chin, by the way. We talk about McGee's chin. We forget to talk about Canelo. He has a great chin, a great chin. And not that he caught, got caught that many real clean ones, but he's got a great chin. Uh, we talk about all the assets of Canelo, but the one that really showed itself and was used to the utmost in this fight for his success, his experience. His experience. His experience beat the guy with less experience. Where, again, McGee did some of his work for Canelo. By coming in there hot, he won the first three rounds, he backed him up, and but he stayed there in front in a predictable manner too long. See, I teach in the gym, you got to learn how much time you have. Like, you only got a certain amount of time. Do I have time for five punches? Or do I have time for one? And I got to get out because this guy's going to punch back within that time frame. You got to get a feel for that. You got to get a... And he lost that feel for that where he was just throwing. And the difference was Canelo was placing. McGee was throwing. But Canelo was looking to play shots. And he can't play shots if you're not in front of him. And McGee was in front of him throwing punches. Not saying, oh, I only got time for one here. Let me get out. I'll come back to it later. No, he was just throwing. And he was staying in front too long. And that's where I made the note. He's going to get caught. He should get on the outside. He should mix it up a little bit. I would have liked to see McGee win it on the outside more. Take away the ability of Canelo to counter him by using a long jab, don't give him anything to counter, stay on the outside with the jab, set punches up off that, and use your legs. mcgee has got pretty good legs. Go off to the side, change your range once in a while. But he didn't do that for the most part. He stayed in front of, and look, it made for a good fight. I think his stock raised, his stock went up. He lost the fight, but his stock went up, and the way that he performed, the way he behaved, the way he got off the floor, the way he finished in the late rounds, uh, all of it. But I just would have liked to have seen, and that's where the lack of experience came in, where McGee would have stayed outside, stayed away from the counter opportunities, made it hard for for. Canelo to catch him and make Canelo find him by moving forward because there's one thing that older fighters when they start getting older that they start to show it it's in their legs where their legs aren't as fast Canelo never had fast legs that's one of the reasons why he lost to Mayweather his hands were fast enough but his legs were too slow to close the gaps you know on a great fighter and a great defensive fighter and a fast fighter like Mayweather. But when you get older, your legs get slower. You get more ponderous. And it's harder to close gaps. And your power's still there. Uh, matter of fact, uh, his his power was still there. He his, 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 the snap of his punches for Canelo, all of that was his IQ, of course. He was understanding what he had to do. Even his timing. He was a little tiny off early because he got swarmed. But then once he settled down, his timing of counter punches, his timing of, of throwing a punch at the right time while McGee was throwing was really good. But I would have liked to see McGee stretch out the ring on the outside force Canelo to use those older legs to come to him 
to walk to him a little bit, to work in that kind of way, not just to be able to sit in the eye of the storm. And he did that beautifully. To sit in the eye of the storm, in the eye of the hurricane, where everything's twirling around him, all those punches from McGee are coming, and he's in that little quiet place on the inside, and all the punches come, and bang, bang, he's picking his spots, and then he, of course he caught it with that uppercut in that kind of way. He did a great job that way, Canelo. Again, I think it was exactly what his people, why they picked McGee. They knew that uh, their experience, their style, would suit them at this point in McGee's career very much. And they were right. Uh, and they went out there and they executed with a younger fighter, with a fighter who can punch, with a fighter who does throw a lot of punches. So kudos to them. They did a, they did a really, you know, they did a really good job. Um, the first round, like I said, uh, it, it it was a, I think it was a little bit almost similar in a different way to the Beaver fight for Canelo where he was a little surprised. I think he got surprised by how good Beaver was, how good Beaver controlled distance, controlled range. Um, I don't think he was really ready for that Canelo. And I think, again, I think he was a little surprised by Magia's just the abundance of coming out of the gates as hot as he did. Uh, and, and backing him up uh, the way that he did. So, uh, I, I again, it's it still frustrates me. I, I like to try to stand up for the sport as best I can and for the fighters. And to not give McGee on the TV, you know, on that TV uh, breakdown of the scores, where the scorer put it up on the, on the screen, on the graphic, not to have those first three rounds for McGee, I, I, it's just not right. It's just not right. Uh, at the end of the day, yeah, Canelo won the fight, but not to give what he deserves credit for during the, you know, while he's fighting. That's it's just wrong. Um, I, I'm trying to see if there was anything else that I made a note of, but uh, for me. For me, that that was it, and like I said, Canelo has changed. He slowed down. Uh, I think that if 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 it was the Canelo of even a few years ago in there in the same situation, he might might have an opportunity to stop McGee because. When he hurt McGee, when he did catch him some shots, there were single shots. Where a few years ago, they would have been two or three shots. And they would have been followed up by more shots. So, in that way, I think that's the most distinct way I can explain the change in Canelo. That he has slowed down in that kind of way. And then, like I said, in some ways, it's made him better in certain fights where he plays his shot, he's patient, he, you know, he takes his time, and, and it was perfect for this fight. I just think that if he was the Canelo of old, that was busier, that would put more punches together at certain times, he might have had a chance when he caught McGee with those shots to follow up, and maybe, as game as McGee is, maybe get established but at the end of the day a good fight uh a good you know obviously everything great for canelo on single de mayo the mexican fans are the best fans in the world in boxing they we have a lot of great fans in boxing but it'd be hard to find better fans than them uh they 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 obviously all came out they all got what they want and uh it was you know it was a it was a good fight uh, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, what about Benavides? Well, unless Turkey al Sheik gets involved and puts the money up, I think it's pretty, and again, it's not me knocking Canelo. I think he's made it pretty clear. Unless that kind of money is there, and that money's only going to come from Saudi Arabia, to be honest, unless that kind of money is there, uh, Canelo's got no interest in fighting uh, Benavides right now. And also, 
if that fight does happen, if the money does get there, because I know a lot of fans want that fight, I'd like to see it too. It would have to happen, Ken, for Canelo to have a chance. A lot of people say Benitez would, uh, Benavides would just beat him. I'm not one of those people. I like Benavides a lot. I like his father a lot. I like the uh, what they do, but it would be it would be a very interesting fight if it's made no later than the next year. If you go past the next year, then I think it becomes too late for Canelo, where it's at a disadvantage for Canelo because he's getting older. And he and it shows. And, he's getting and he older, need, but he's also at this point got so much money. I mean, so much. Well, that, money yeah, that but I mean, for that fight, he would more. be up. For that fight, he would be up. It's it's pride. It's it's legacy. I think he would be up for that. You're right. He don't need it. He don't need it unless he needs it. And what do pride I mean by and that? Legacy. Yeah, I totally agree. But the level that commitment of pride and legacy versus fighting like your life depends on it when you're young in the sport and every fight is critically important. I just feel like maybe he still has it, but that's a huge variable. That's what made the old-time fighters so special. That's what made Michael Jordan so special. After he had all the money that that the Federal Reserve had almost, Michael Jordan still would play you like it was life and death. He would play same you with, like same you, with uh, Brady. Uh, yeah, he would play you like you were his worst enemy. He would play you like his life depended on it. It's in you or it's not in you. Um, That's right. The old time fighters that would made him so great. The old time Mexican fight. The, the history of Mexican fighters is so many great ones. So many great ones. Uh, when I say that Canelo's not the greatest, and there's other, it's not knocking or taking away from Canelo. It's stating a fact that a lot of fans don't appreciate how many great Mexican fighters were there before Canelo, and how they fought everybody, even after the. You know, everything is relative. Back then, they didn't make the money they make today, but it was, but it was the good money for them. And no matter how much they had made then, no matter how much, how many victories they had, no matter how much success they had, how many accomplished, they still wanted to find out how they would act with the best, whoever the best was next, how they would, how they would fare with the best. It was in them. That that's part of why I, I still talk about them and I say they were the greatest fighters some of these guys and some of the mexican fighters i talk about so canelo i believe if it did come down to benefits but i do think it would have to be motivated by the money if it did come down to that with all the money that canelo's made all the accomplishments uh you know he's a he's a national icon in his country with all of that i think he'd be up for the fight my fear would be for the time that I think it has to be in the next year. Otherwise, better Venus has too much of an advantage. And some people think he beats him right now. And again, I understand that. I'm not so willing to just mark that box and just say, yeah, Benavides beats Canelo. I'm not so quick to say that. Um, Canelo would still be uh, a really good, interesting fight with Benavides. It would be a hell of an interesting matchup because Canelo is experienced. Canelo can punch. Benavides, yeah. Benavides is a big guy. Yeah, he's aggressive. You know, yeah, he's, you know, he's a big puncher. All of that. Uh, and he's, and he's, um, you know, he, he presents himself uh, like a monster, you know, like a Mexican monster, they call him, right? Um, but, with his attitude, with the way that he goes about his business. But still, Canelo can punch at the right time. I could see his his technique is a little bit purer than uh, Benavides's in some areas where his punch is a little more concise, a little more succinct, a little straighter, a little shorter. I could see with the possibility of him being able to catch an aggressive uh, Benavides in between one of those biggest shots that Benavides throws, uh, and Benavides would try to impose his physicality and his will on Canelo. I have no doubt about it, but I, I don't, I do not count out Canelo in that fight. I'm not saying I pick him; it'd be a hell of a fight to watch. But 
if we ever get it. We're not going to get it, though, I don't think. Not, not because strictly what the people are going to think, I'm going to say, because the money and because Canelo doesn't want it right now. I think that Benavides and his father, and like I said, I like those guys a lot. I like the way they, I just like the way they go about their business. Uh, I like the kid as a fighter, his personality. I, I like him. But I think they made a mistake fighting uh, Alexander Volzik. I, I Nobody's talking about that fight. They put up the promotion on it on television the other night during the Canelo McGee fight, and they don't talk about Vosik at all. They they talk like it's a foregone conclusion that when when Benavides beats him, you know, then it'll be him versus the winner of Bevo Benavides, you know, unless Canelo somehow pops up somewhere, you know. But that's all they're talking about. They they forgot about Vosik, a former world champion. He's naturally the bigger guy. I know he's a little older, but he's been off. He was retired. He's only had two fights back. He's come back without me, obviously. But that doesn't change the fact of what I feel and what my opinion is and what my judgment tells me uh, and, and my experience and knowledge of him tells me. I think they're making a mistake. I think that Benefitus and his father are not aware fully of what Vozik represents. This is a I guy think that a lot of a- people a lot of people forget he was up on the cards in going into the tenth round against Arter Better B of arguably the best in the world in a long time to do it at light heavyweight. And to your point, so much attention on that big money fight. It's like the perfect storm in terms of overlooking this kid uh alex and could be a huge opportunity for well alex he's not a kid he's uh, he's 37 sorry, years I, re- he's not sorry. A kid. I refer to but, everyone but, as a kid no no but, but i didn't mean that as an insult i just no no it's not an insult but he's not a kid his, his age a lot of people think that's against him i don't think it is because he's not used up he hasn't fought he hasn't been in the ring yeah he only had two fights back he was off for a couple of years all that they figure is against him but He's got the experience of a former world champion. He's still got the same skill sets. He's naturally the bigger guy as a light heavyweight. Benavides is moving up from super middleweight. Even though he's a big guy, he's still moving up. Uh, Vozik, like I said, he's got the confidence of having been a world champion. Uh, He's also a former Olympian. He won the bronze medal, so he's got the pedigree. He's got the experience in amateurs, all of that, all those experiences. And he can fight. He can punch. He's a good defensive fighter. He's a good counter punch. He's got good legs. He can choose to box on the outside, pick spots, give angles like he did when he won a light heavyweight t- title against uh, the, the hardest puncher in boxing at the time, arguably uh, Adonis Stevenson. Man, Wilder, one punch, Wilder was probably a, the hardest puncher. But Adonis Stevenson was right there and was a better boxer than Wilder. Uh, he had a better delivery system. And he was able to beat Adonis. He was able to disarm him. He was able to stop him. Thank God Adonis had suffered an injury in that fight afterwards. So we thought, God forbid, that he was going to die. Uh, he went into a coma. He got knocked out in the 11th round. But thank God he recovered. Thank God that Adonis Stevenson is uh, is living a life now. And, you know, he, um, he, he, he did recover from that. But again... Vosik, I don't think they're aware of really completely what they're getting. I think they're looking at all the negatives that he that he retired. He's been awful, you know, so long. He's only had two fights against obviously low level opposition to come back. Um, they, you know, they he got stopped late by Better B of his only loss. I don't think they're they're looking at the things that I would look at. And want to look at it and want to know going into a fight with a former world champion that he can punch. Like I said, he can fight outside. He can fight inside if he has to. He can back you up. He can set traps. He can counter punch. Um, you know, and, and he's you know, he, he, he's been on a weight program. I think he's going to be a bigger, stronger version of himself. 
Uh, I, I th- it's going to be interesting. Again, I think everyone's sleeping on that. Everyone's talking about everybody else and forgetting all about him. He might be that fly in the ointment. He might be the party pooper that changes a lot of plans. But anyway, that's a pretty, I hope, a good breakdown of uh, of not only the McGee Canelo fight, but everything swirling around it. Uh, every everything that's you know that is part of that fight. Yeah, love it. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the undercard on that Canelo fight. Brandon Figueroa gets a ninth round stoppage on um, Jesse Magdalena, who came in two and a half pounds over the um, featherweight limit. He came in at 28.6 pounds. And I think the weight might have kept him in the fight a little bit longer than he would have otherwise because it looked like Figueroa was just slowly breaking him down, breaking him down. And then finally, with a second left in the ninth round, hit him with a beautiful body shot, and ended the fight. How'd you like the performance? Yeah, I think the only thing, really, to be honest with you, I don't think it was the weight. I think the only thing, Figueroa, he's one of my favorite fighters, just because the way he fights and and the way the kid is. He doesn't talk much. He just fights. And, yeah, he gets hit too much. Yeah, you got to watch that. You can't have a real long career. You get hit like that. Uh, He walks in, but, man, he don't stop. He don't stop. You know, he's relentless. He's got the heart as big as the outdoors. And uh, he's not a big puncher. I think that's what kept Magalino in it. I think two things kept him in it to that point. One, that uh, he's a southpaw Magalino. I think it took a minute for Figueroa to figure that out a little bit uh, in in real time. (laughs) And Figueroa, like I say, he's not a big puncher. He's a relentless puncher. He, He... you know, he, he's a volume puncher. He, he throws punches in, not in punch. He don't throw them in bunches. He throws them in barrels. I mean, he just, <laughs> he just, he just keeps coming. But it takes a little while for his engine to get going sometimes. And I think it took a couple rounds for his engine to kind of get going. And I also think he hurt himself a little bit early by not going to the body enough. I was making notes in that fight too, saying he needs to go to the body more. And then he started going to the body a little more. What did he do? He stops with a beautiful left hook to the liver with one second left uh, in one of the late rounds, ninth round, whatever round that was. I really, uh, he's a former world champion, Figueroa. Uh, He's a guy that you just, you, you can't help but like him. You know, again, with his approach, he's, he doesn't do a lot of talking. He just goes in there, and he's looking to get to you and throw punches. Uh, but Magdalino did a good job boxing early. Uh, it took a while, and then he started getting broken down. But the early six rounds, five, six rounds, whatever it was, he did a really nice job, seven round, whatever. He started getting broken down. The pressure usually does that. Well, if a guy puts pressure on you and he goes to the body and he stays on you, he's doing it for a reason. He's doing it hoping that he will break you down. And that's what Figueroa's game plan always is. And he finally acted on it in the ninth round. He finally got what he wanted. But before that, Magladino did a good job. Did a good job fighting Figueroa the way you're supposed to fight him. Counter him on the outside, pot shot him on the outside, use your legs, move a little bit, keep more balance, you know, tie him up on the inside. The fight was a little ugly uh, with all the tying up that was going on early. It was a little ugly, a little sloppy in spots. Uh, like I said, it, it it took a while for Mac Delino to finally... Oh, it took a while for Figueroa to finally break down Magdaleno and get him where he wanted him, where, you know, he was able to land that left hook to the liver. But um, Magdaleno, like I said, he at the end, it, it didn't help him. But he had the right fight plan uh, uh, early on. Boxing, picking spots inside, tying up, you know, moving. But at the end of the day, the pressure was too much. And Figueroa got to him. What's the next one? Barrios and Madonna? Mario Barrios beats uh, Marcos Madonna's little brother, Fabian Madonna. Unanimous decision. Um, all three judges had the score the same here. 116-111, largely one-sided. Um uh, Barrios had a swelling under his eye. He retains his WBC interim title. That's the title that 
Terrence Crawford is expected to vacate as he moves up to junior middleweight, so it's expected that Barrios will be elevated to the status of champion. But again, it's an interim title, and and the the reigning champ is um, Crawford, who's no threat to ever fight either of these guys anytime soon. So Mario Barrios could be the uh, you know in the mix in the welterweight division near the top. As a result, how'd you like the fight? Look, I like Barrios. Um... Madad is a good little boxer. He got dropped. He showed a lot of heart. He got dropped with the right hand earlier in the fight. I think it was in the third round. He got blinded by the jab, and the right hand landed. Uh, beautiful setup by Barrios. Madonna got off the floor. Most people thought he was going to get stopped at that point. And, you know, he went to distance. Uh, but do it enough to lose. Do it enough to lose well. Uh, not, not do it enough to win. Uh, not taking the chances, not throwing enough punches where he actually would give himself a chance to win. He was looking to counter punch. He was picking spots. He was looking to survive Madonna. He's a good little boxer. He's a good little counter puncher. Uh, he boxes really well. He's got good eyes. He's got good defense, good vision, like I said. Uh, but in this fight with Barrios, he got into a situation where if he drew more punches, he would have gave himself a better chance to win. But if he drew more punches, he would have gave Barrios a better chance to catch him. So Madonna made a decision to throw just enough, you know, fight a decent fight, lose and lose. Lose her a decision that I guess, uh, you know, you you could say you lost in a, you know, in a decent way if, if there's such a thing where, um, you, you know, you're... You showed you could box. Uh, you showed you could go the distance with a former world champion. A, f- a champion now and a former champion. Barrios had moved up from 140 where he was a world champion because he lost his title there. Uh, he got knocked out by Tank Davis. But uh, Barrios, I like him. Barrios is a, is a real tough game guy, a real fighter. And he's, he's always, you know, he's always going to give you everything. He's changed. I used the term earlier, like an old wine. He's he's a little bit like that. Barrios used to be a guy who just threw punches at you. On top of you, always throwing. He paid a price for that against Tank Davis, you know, and he got, he got caught on the inside by one of the best fighters pound for pound in the business right now, uh, Tank Davis, who also happens to be one of the best punches pound for pound in the business right now. Uh, he was in front of Tank too much, probably. He got caught. I've seen a change in Barrios. Uh, you know, moving up from junior welterweight to welterweight. Give him a lot of credit. He beat Ugas uh, to win that title, to win the, whatever that was, the interim title. Uh, he is more... He doesn't just throw punches now. Now now he boxes more. Now, he, now he's more he's more patient uh, he's more conservative. He's still throwing enough punches, but he's using his jab. He's setting the shots up. He's a good body puncher. Uh, he's he's not. He's just not on top of you, just throwing every second. He's thinking a little more. You know, he's boxing a little bit more. He's he's just uh, yeah. He's he's more patient. He's he he's he's showing a an other side to himself. As a fighter, a fighter who's now more conscious of, instead of just throwing punches, throwing them at the right time, not throwing at the wrong time, you know, being more of a complete boxer. And a lot of people probably would have said, oh, he was better when he was throwing more punches. I'm not one of those people. I think Barrios now, at this point in his career, is actually better, that he's smarter like I said, he's he's fighting in the spots that he should fight. He probably listened to Kenny Rogers' song, The Gambler. You know, <laughs> know when to hold him, when to fold him. You know, he, he he's picking the spots a lot better now. He's more of a complete fighter now. I like the performance by, uh, by Barrios uh, against Madonna, the younger brother, like you said, of the former world champion, Marcos Madonna. And uh, I uh, would see, you know, Barrios also had to deal with a swollen eye, like you touched on, and uh, it was just about close. So, obviously, he dealt with that pretty well too. 
Yep. Before we jump into the UFC, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends at Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink. You take it once a day, made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It's got all your minerals, vitamins, probiotics, prebiotics that you need to maintain a healthy diet. Even the healthiest of diet can be missing some of the micronutrients contained in Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of a special offer for our listeners. 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Um, the travel packs are invaluable if you're spending time on the road. I take sometimes two a day when I'm traveling. Um, athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the offer. Teddy, let's speaking of travel and let's talk about the UFC down in Rio de Janeiro. Um, Alex Pantoja defends his title against Steve Ursig. Ursig, what a story. He's been in the UFC for about a year and a half, came in at 9-1, and one, and in his fourth UFC fight, he's challenging for the title. I thought that the score was correct, three rounds to two for um, Pantoja, but a lot of people thought that Ursig did enough in the last round to win that fight. Uh, the scorecards were 48-47 twice, and one guy had 49-46. But I think most people agreed that it came down to the last round, and I see a lot of UFC fighters weighing in that thought Ursig did enough to win. Curious to hear what you thought on this one. Ursig looked great on the feet, but Pantoja's pace and level is just insane. I heard... Um, I heard... Um, our friend, um, the bad guy... Uh, I'm spacing on his name. Kel, Chel Sonnen, sorry. Chel Sonnen describing him saying he has an ability to scramble like he's never seen. He's like, it, it, those scrambles in wrestling and grappling take so much out of you. And he said he's never seen anyone scramble with the tenacity of a Pantoja. It's just head and shoulders, better fitness than anyone he's seen. Uh, how'd you like the fight? It was a terrific fight. First of all, on the on the card on the, before that, I want to congratulate my friend Anthony Lionheart Smith. Uh, oh, what a win! Yeah, really, a great upset win. You know, versus eleven year old, eleven and old uh, sensation of uh, Vitor Petrino, and uh, I mean Smith. I don't know. I don't have the ages in front of me, but he's probably ten years older than uh, the undefeated prospect Vitor. Petrino, who was a huge favorite. And was calling him out. He was calling for the fight with Anthony Smith. Yeah, it was just a great... It was it was a great reminder of how powerful an asset Hart, obviously Hart, they all have Hart, but uh, you're not called Lionheart if you don't have a little extra in that area. But it, Hart in experience... Like I talked about earlier, Canelo, the biggest thing for Canelo over McGee was yeah, his talent, terrific, but experience. That was really the, the one biggest difference. And that was the difference, and that was the winning difference for my friend Anthony Smith. It really was, because the experience. Uh, you had the young Vitor Petrino, 11-0, and 0, by the way, and the ages were ages were twenty six for um, Petrino and thirty five, thirty five for um, nine year difference, thirty five for Anthony. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's what I thought. Ten nine years, ten years. Um, just Petrino made a mistake. You can't make a mistake with an experienced guy like Smith. And you know they're striking. The early part of the fight was striking. Uh, both of them going back and forth, and. All of a sudden, Petrino goes for the takedown. He goes in, and Smith, with his experience, his, his ability, his experience, his toughness, everything, but his calmness. He saw right away, he came in, he left himself vulnerable his neck. He gets him into a grip, a guillotine-type grip, and... Petrino makes the mistake of picking him up off the ground and then slamming him to the ground. And Anthony Smith had his hooks into him. He had the that guillotine. Only made the, that only made the uh, choke uh, tighter. And oh, it was an God. arm in guillotine, which is a little bit harder to get, but he had him so he had his arm so tight under his chin, there was no getting out of it. Uh, Petrino couldn't tap quick enough. No, he, he, was, got the first he, he was in a bad spot. No, just congratulate first round. And again, first round submit, but don't sleep on experience. As far as Pantoja and 
Ursaic, great fight. First round, Pantoja, like the great uh, Chael Sonnen said, he's got a hell of an engine. He never stops this guy. You know, I don't even know if he stops to eat. He probably eats on a run. <laughs> You know, he probably runs past the joint or his, or his table and they throw the food at him and he, he grabs it and he eats it as he's moving. I mean, this guy don't stop. He don't stop looking to always come forward. But that works against him sometimes where he's rushing in and he could get caught with counters rushing in. But his, def- his offense in that way becomes his defense where he keeps you, you know, he makes it hard for you to get a counter off because he'll come at you when you don't expect it. He'll come at you fast and sometimes looks not to give you a chance to get a counter. Off. But Pantoja's greatest strength is on the floor, for me at least. It's on the floor when he gets you, his hands on you against the fence or against the cage or on the floor. Um, he, he, he got a takedown in the first round. Uh, I think he had two takedowns, Pantoja, in the first round. Erzsaig is really a nice striker. And you touched on it, Ken. He's only had four fights in the UFC. I mean, that's extraordinary. This guy is good. And he's fighting the top guy, one of the top fighters in the UFC, period. And he's and it's, you know, it's tooth and nail. So first round, uh, Erzsaig showed his greatest ability, his striking Terrific striker, always set to punch. He was going backwards sometimes, maybe a little bit too much, getting forced back. But you know what I was impressed with? When he went backwards, he was still able to counter. He was still able to get get his punches off, set his feet where he could counter. Uh, even when he was forced back, when first round went to Pantoja. So as far as I go, it's one nothing. Um, he he uh, he got the. He got to fight to the area that he wanted more on the mat. And and that's his area. That's his environment. You know, that's his playground. You know, get get a guy, get his hands on you, get you on the mat if he can. Ursay controls the range really well striking. Uh, he seemed to have the edge in the striking. But I'll tell you, Pantoja, when you think that he's, you know, He's just a guy coming in aggressive, which he is. And when it comes to the striking, he's also a guy that when he uses his jab, he's got a good jab. He's also a guy that obviously can hold his own with the striking. And he had his moments too with the striking. But at the end of the day, you just knew that the guy who would want to be striking, I think more consistent, was Ursaic. It was just up to Pantoja whether or not he was going to let him have that landscape to strike. Second round, Pantoja, like I said, always looking to get in, get his hands on on you. He got inside. Uh Ursay was still looking for the still looking for the uh, by the way, I want to point out that Pantoja was fighting in his home country, Brazil. Uh that's not a that's not bad advantage to have, just to have all the people behind you in your home country. But uh Ursay was still looking for counters. I thought that he needed to use his jab a little bit more in between when he wasn't countering because he's got a good jab. He used it, but I thought he could have used it. I, I thought the more he uses it, the more effective he is. Um, so Ursay uh, was striking well. He caught, he caught him. Did you see the elbow that he caught? Uh, yeah. Panjojo with uh, they so I mean, creative. They, oh, they, he's really dangerous with those elbows. He splits you, he cuts you up, and obviously, you know, who wants to get hit with a freaking elbow? Um, but Ursay was pushing Panjojo back in spots, striking, mixing in counters, uh, really well. Uh, Pantoja got a takedown in the second round, too. But he didn't really maintain control. It was really a close round. Uh, I gave it to Ursay. I, I gave the second round, like I said, close. But I gave it to Ursay. Uh, I had it 1-1 going into the third. The third round, Pantoja was pressing forward. Uh, he wasn't reaching as much. Uh, the jab of Ursay again, when he used it, it was important. 
Uh, I didn't think he used it quite enough. Uh, Ernst Sank uh, was picking spots, scoring, striking. But Pantoja, Pantoja just kept coming always, as he always does. Uh, he got off some good counter punches, uh, Pantoja, when he was striking. Uh, he did some good striking Pantoja in spots in that third round. Uh, there was a takedown. Pantoja scrambled on the mat at the end. Uh, he really is a master on that mat. And Pantoja was uh, caught two huge shots, uh, elbow and a punch uh, in, that, in that round. But I had the third round at the end of the day going to Pantoja so I had it, I had it um, two to one going into the fourth. The fourth round, I thought it was the easiest round to score. Urse was in charge early with striking, using the jab, pressing the fight. Uh, again, only his fourth UFC fight, very, very impressive. Uh, I thought he was winning the round with strikes not allowing Pedroza really to come forward. Urse was uh, controlling the round, mixing in combos, counters. Uh, he um, he even pressed Pedroza back in spots. He mixed it up really well in the striking department. Uh, he landed an uppercut that was really a nice punch. Both guys have obviously uh, steel chins, and Wills. Fourth round, Urse, I thought he won it clear. So it came down, it was 2-2 for me. It came down to the last round. And the third round was very close. That's one that I would put up there before I go into the fifth. The third round for me was close. It was a tough round to pick. But anyway, I, I had it 2-2 going into the fifth. Urse got a takedown early in the round. But then Pantoja did his thing. He scrambled. He got the edge. I mean, really, he, he's he's unbelievable down there. Uh, when he gets his hands on you, you you usually have a problem. Urse, uh, he got back to striking, controlling range. Uh, when he got off the floor, uh, he was countering well. Uh, while Pantoja was batting, badly bleeding. Bleeding pretty badly. Uh, but then he got a takedown, Pantoja. Uh, matter of fact, it was a takedown by Urse. Uh, and I thought that was what turned around the way uh, around for me. Because Urse got the takedown and Pantoja reversed positions. And he got complete control on the mat. And I thought he won the round then, controlling it in his element. You know, his environment. He used his experience, his skills on the mat for me to win uh, to win that round. Urse, I thought, made the mistake in the fifth round. He should have continued striking. He went for the takedown, and I thought that got him into Pantoja's, you know, like I said, his neighborhood, his geography where he's at his best. And I thought it cost Urse the fight, at least on my scorecard. I had a 3-2 to two for Pantoja. Oh, good. Same. Anyway, excellent fight. Um, one more boxing match that we um, happened not over the weekend, but early morning today, and that was Noya Inoue gets a six round stoppage over um, Lewis Neary. What a good fight. Noya Inoue dropped for the first time in the first round with a good shot, clean shot, good knockdown. And uh, But my God, he's just so many levels, seems to be so many levels above the competition. He unifies another weight class second time. He's the undisputed. He has every belt in the weight class. Um, gets the six-round stoppage, knocks down Neary three times, finally stops him in the uh, sixth round with a devastating punch. Um, how'd you like that one? I like watching great and um you know in a way is great for a lot of reasons but um and he showed one of them that he never had to show before that he not only fights like a champion he behaves like one like i like to say uh he got off the floor he got off the floor and he behaved like a champion he's great for that reason he's great for for every reason he's great because he's a 
He's moved up so many weight classes, carried his power, carried his skills. He's got fast hands when he wants to use them. His technique is good. He puts nice short punches together when he has to. <laughs> he controls range well. He can use his legs. He can step out of range. He don't have to just walk forward. He counter punches. He sets traps. And then he goes and freaking gets you and gets you out of there like a monster usually does. And he's a great body puncher. And he's a terrific finisher. Why? Because he's, he's calm in an uncalm environment. He sees things other people don't see. He slows it down for himself. Like Michael Jordan talked about in basketball, slowing the game down. Don't let the game get ahead of you. He never lets the fight get ahead of him. He slows it down. He sees things like Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford, I think, is pound for pound the best fighter in the world. I think, in a way, is pound for pound the second best fighter in the world. And there's not a lot to separate them. Um, he, in a way, sees things other people, like Crawford, don't see. You know, and and he's he sees, instead of one way to hit you, he sees ten ways to hit you. He, he's like an android. You know, he's like the Terminator with the red lines and all that stuff. You know, he, he's, he's seen, but he's seen it in real speed. In real speed. He's seeing that, and not everybody can do that. Not everyone can do that. His, his punches to finish that fight were beautiful. They were accurate, they were beautiful, but they were intelligent. They were educated punches. They were, again, because his vision, because he was able to see things, see the openings, see what made sense. Uh, you know, that he got dropped in the first round. He got dropped because he was throwing a punch. He was throwing a right hand, and he got caught with the southpaw's power punch, the backhand, the left hand. He was throwing, and he punched with him, and he caught him as he's throwing it. Obviously, his hand was away from his jaw, and as he's throwing the left hand, caught him and dropped him. Then in the second round, he comes back and returns to favor. You know, he, he returns the favor and he goes and immediately uh, immediately drops drops Neary and evens it out. Two 10-8 rounds uh, back to back. And, and then he changed. Like early on, he was very, I think he was a little bit caught cold. I noticed that he was, he was very dry and I thought that he was caught a little cold like Maybe mentally cold too, not only physically, but taking nothing away from Neary. Good puncher, experienced guy, <laughs> southpaw. I think that threw off in a way a little bit early on too. But he was early on in the first round, in a way was stepping back a lot. And he was stepping back on the straight line a little bit. Um, I, I loved when he steps back a little bit. Not when he steps back too far. But he was stepping back out of... A little too much. He he was in a very sort of uh, defensive sort of mentality early on, where you you could say he's they're filling each other out. He's looking to see what he's got to see, but I don't think he was hitting on all cylinders early. Like I said, I I think early on he he was he was just he he was in a a gear of almost an in between gear. No, nowhere where there was traction. Even going back, when he goes back, usually he goes back just enough where he's going to set a trap. He was just going back. He was just surveying things. He was he was just out there, and I think that, uh, like I said, I think he was a little bit, tiny bit caught cold mentally, if not mentally and physically early on. And and not to take away from Neary, Neary through the threw the southpaw left hand as in a way was throwing, and he caught him, and he dropped him. And second round, I just, the reason I felt that way about the first round, that he wasn't in gear, I saw a dramatic difference in the second. Obviously, you had to. He just got dropped. But I saw him now, instead of just moving, moving backwards where there's no pressure on Neary, you know, there's no there's no fear given to Neary about the monster. He's just moving. And Neary could feel good. He could feel like he could let his hands go. He didn't have so much to worry about. Second round, it changed fast. Because in a way, he had to change. And all of a sudden, the second round, the little subtle things. Now, he, when he steps back, he's stepping back, like I said earlier. He's just stepping back, just out of range, but ready to punch. 
Not just moving back, just to move back. Now he's moving back just to get out of range. If the guy comes in, I'm going to catch him. Just just enough. And But he was in control. He was, he was the boss. He was, and he was moving his head more. So now the second round he's there. He's not just, you know, in that kind of moving around mode. Now he's in front. He's moving his head. What's moving the head to? Well, it makes a harder target, right, Ken? It makes it yep. harder to hit the guy. But it, it does something else. It puts pressure on the other guy. Because now you're moving your head. If the guy throws, he misses. You're right there to counter. And he's, so he's putting subtle pressure. I don't think anyone even notices it. He's putting pressure now. Now he's moving his head. Now he's putting pressure on, on this guy who scored a knockdown, you know, the round before. And he's making him think. He's making him, he's making him a little tense about if I throw, uh-oh, this guy would throw. So he's moving his head. And when he's taking his steps, he's taking more definitive steps, more calculated steps, steps to do something, to get out of range, maybe set a trap, and then to come right back to being a boss again. So huge difference. The It's like it's like that, that game show years ago on TV, What's My Line? With the real... With the real Ken right out, please stand up. And then you got <laughs> the other guys making believe they're going to stand. And then, then Ken right out st- stands up. Uh, will the real in a way stand up? The real in a way stood up in his second round, doing those things, making those changes that I just talked about. And then he, and then he scored a knockdown um, with a beautiful trap. Was reminiscent of when Tank Davis set a trap against. Uh, Raleigh Romero where same thing where he, he took a step back Raleigh Romero reached in a little bit you know looking for the big power shot and what did Tank Davis do? Bang! He hit him with the counter the fight was over well this wasn't over yet but it was the same sort of idea the same thing where he, he steps back in a way he sets a trap and Neary reached in and he caught him a beautiful left hook counter in a way he did. Real nice. Just just the way you draw it up. The way you would teach it in the gym. So he gets the knockdown there. And uh, he's in control of the fight now. That was the fourth round, I think. Um, he started to look. The way he was picking the spots. He got complete control of the fight. And... The way he was picking the spots, especially in the fourth round, I made a note to myself. On the outside, you know, he was looking, he was picking spots, he was in complete control. He was starting to take Neary apart brick by brick. Not five bricks at a time. The guy's too dangerous. The, 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 the walls might fall on you if you take five bricks. The house might fall on you. You don't want the house to fall on you. So he's taking one brick at a time away from Neary until finally the house fell on its own. And it was beautiful to watch. He was just taking, taking a little. And you know what he, he looked like while he was doing that? He looked like a hawk. He looked yeah. like a hawk in the sky that is looking down with those great eyes and it sees its prey. And it's got its prey down there and then it swoops in, bop! And it just grabs his prey. He looked like a hawk. He was just in front of the guy looking. And then bop, bop, bop. He was just just picking the spots. Just picking the spots. Taking little pieces. Little pieces away from Neary. I was so impressed. I mean, I knew the kind of fight I was watching. But to watch it and to watch it after him having adversity of being dropped, of, 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 you know, like I always say, you don't know about your friends, you don't know about anybody that you might think you know until they're tested. I know it's cynical, it sounds very difficult, but you know what? Welcome to life. You, you really <laughs> don't know until there's a situation to test that person if they're going to stand up in a way that you would hope they stand up. Same thing, same thing in boxing. In a way, got tested, and man, he showed 
he is that guy. He is he is that guy. And uh, he was looking to land the southpaw killer, the right hand. Uh, he knew that that would work. So he was picking spots with the right hand uh, against the southpaw Neary. And then the final punch and punches that ended it. I'll finish with that. What a well-orchestrated finish. He used a throwaway left hook. Yeah, a throwaway. It was a throwaway left hook similar to what Canelo did to score the right uppercut knockdown in the fourth round with McGee. He he used a throwaway left hook, in a way did, to force Neary to cover which distracted him just long enough. See, that forced him to cover up, you know, to cover himself up. And when he does that, you kind of get distracted. You might even get blinded to something coming on the other side. That is the idea. And that's exactly what happened. He distracted him long enough for in a way to find the right uppercut. And then with the same hand, after he lands the right uppercut, the same same hand, what's he do? He re, he brings it up on top, you know, he re-chambers it, he throws the right uppercut, and then he brings it back up, and he throws the straight right hand to the head to finish the job. And he caught Neary. I talk about vision. I talk about having those hawk eyes. He caught Neary as he was throwing and missing with the left hand, which, of course, left that side of his jaw, wide open. Beautiful finish, beautiful everything. Uh, Beautiful comeback from getting dropped for the first time. Just, again, just a, just a marvelous performance. And very, uh, I just want to make sure he got full credit, even if it took a couple minutes, it didn't take that long, but... I wanted. To, I didn't want to just say one to fight. And the one thing of I want to, I want to add to that, is real quick, the fight before that, the cold feature, uh, Japanese fighter uh, Takai uh, fought the champion Maloney. Takai won the world title for Maloney. He he showed he showed tremendous heart and resiliency. Uh, by Maloney, the the champion going in. Tremendous heart and resiliency. Uh, and both of them did. Uh, the last round was a spectacular round. The 12th round was as good as it gets because Maloney knew that he was behind. For the most part, Takai had, it, it was kind of like a smaller man's version of Ali and Frazier. You know, Takai was Ali, Maloney was Frazier. Maloney was pressing the fight for the most part all night. Takai was controlling the outside, picking spots, counter punching, getting off, moving to the side, you know, uh trying to trying to keep Maloney from getting to him and and setting camp up on the inside and scoring before Maloney could get to him. And he did a he did a really good job. It was a good fight. He did a really good job. Maloney has a lot of miles on his old dominant at this point. He's been a terrific champ, a terrific fighter. Um, I, I, the wear and tear is starting to show, but I tell you what, it doesn't show on his heart. Uh, it didn't show in the 12th round because in the 12th round, behind on the cards, Maloney just put on a, uh, he he did what he had to do. He came forward, and he just kept coming, and it was a tremendous show of really heart and resiliency in the chin on a part of Takai to survive what, the only way I could describe it, it was like an incredible avalanche of punches in that last round, and he survived it to stay on his feet, the uh, the Japanese fighter, Takai, and he fought back while Maloney just, he, he, he brought the mountain down on top of him. Or he tried to, put it that way. And he tried to save his title with that last minute, uh, with that last round, 
you know, effort and hoping to get a knockout of the challenger, but he couldn't quite get there as Sakai just, you know, he he refused to give in. And uh, Maloney dominated the round, hitting him with everything but the kitchen sink. It was one of the best rounds you're going to see. And Takai earned the win by outboxing the aggressive Maloney. Like I said, throughout the night, controlling the outside, keeping Maloney at the end of his punches for the most part, countering in between, doing what he had to do. You know, had a good game plan, Takai. And uh, Maloney... Terrific career. I don't know what he does now, if he, where he goes after that. Obviously, he'll go somewhere. But what a 12th round. What what an effort by Maloney to try to actually get that, you know, get that last round knockout. Cool. Well, before we, uh, before we preview the Loma Cambosos fight, um, Real quick, wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, Ryan Garcia test positive for uh, anabolic steroids. I believe it was anabolic steroids, but for a, for a banned substance performance enhancer. He's uh, strongly denying it, but usually where there's smoke, there's fire with these tests. No one ever comes out and says, yeah, you got me. I did it. Um, well, don't they do? Well, let me just say, explain for the fans, because you're good at this. Uh, there's an A sample and a B sample. And uh, and so the B also came back, I was told. Is that correct? Uh, positive? Is that is that correct? I'm not positive. I'll, go, I'll check now on the internet, but typically when the A... They basically take a sample, they test some of it, and they hold the rest in, in storage, and it's frozen, and then they test it again. I mean, the chances of the B sample coming back uh, clean after the A sample test positive are slim to none. Um, it's pretty hard defense to just say, like, I don't know what this is from, and it's a tainted supplement, although it has happened, but I often wonder... Did it really happen or did people go to work behind the scenes to make it disappear? And we have like just tons and tons of evidence of failed drug tests that um, have been explained away only to find out, in fact, that they were, in fact, dirty. Um, So I don't know. It doesn't look good for Ryan. I, you know, obviously I can't say he definitely did that. But if you test positive you test positive i don't know what else you can deduce from that but allegedly this kid this guy by the way i didn't mean any offense to alex Vosnick. i call everyone a kid i almost called victor conti a kid no I we think didn't say you made a, a no no my point was this ken you didn't uh, that was in no way taken that way you're the only one thinking yeah. that way it's not taking an offense i made the point of jumping on it because that's where I think a lot of people are discounting discounting the chances of Vazic to win because of his age. They look. No, no, I know what you meant. I yeah, mean, he's thirty. Se- I think he's thirty-seven. I, I, I'm not sure. That's right. But they look at that. They say, "Ah, this guy, come on!" But they're wrong because he's yeah. not old. He's thirty-seven, but he's young. He he's yeah. been. If anything, he's been preserved the last yes. several years because he has not been fighting. Yeah, well, I almost called Victor Conti a kid, and I didn't mean <laughs> I didn't mean to call him a kid either. But Victor Conti says that there is a there is a system there there is a, 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 a circumstance that happens when you're doping outside of like so they all enter this USADA pool, which means let's say it's twelve weeks before the fight. It could be more, it could be less, but it's a period. And if you're not in a doping protocol twenty four seven, three hundred and sixty five days a year, you can easily be doping when you're not in the testing pool and then give yourself a month or two however long it takes to clear your system and then you enter the the pool to start being tested and uh, what what has been alleged that sometimes happens with some of these guys that get caught with these micro uh you know picograms of test of steroids in their system is because according to victor conti and other uh, researchers and experts in the field when you get severely dehydrated to cut weight, some of those substances can still be in your system. They're just at a lower level, but when you get super dehydrated, they're more detectable. So that's why right before, so that people were saying, why would I dope right before the fight? Yes, it wouldn't make sense, but it would make sense that you would get this phenomenon called pulsing, where because you've so dehydrated yourself, that my picogram or whatever it is becomes more evident 
in a more dehydrated fighter. And that's the allegation of what happened is that supposedly, allegedly, he was doping, entered into the pro, into the testing pool, and then when he cut weight and got super dehydrated, the test showed up. And the reason they didn't cancel the fight before the test, Ryan was like, why'd they let me fight? Well, they test you in the days leading up to the fight, and the test takes a certain amount of days to come back, positive or negative. And in this case, the test came back after the fact and said, yeah, during the uh, weight cut period when we tested you, we found this uh, evidence of doping in your system. It was for Osterine, which... I, I don't know like the specifics of each drug, but some anabolic agent, Osterine, that a lot of people have tested positive for over the last several years. So yeah, a lot of skepticism out there. Obviously, Haney's people are very pissed off as they should be if in fact, I mean, if someone fails a drug test, I don't know why you wouldn't assume they were guilty. The burden of proof now is on them to prove that they're innocent. So if you're just going by what the test is, then he tested positive for um steroids and the most likely the result will be vacated and be ruled a no contest and um the loss will be taken off haney's record i'm assuming but yeah interesting uh turn of events all right let me get down to the brass knuckles the brass talk tax um what really matters to to the fans to me to the fans really to the sport first of all i i hear it already in my i could hear it um knowing that the fans, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm not saying I got this perfect, but fans are going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't this the same Conti that was involved in yes. helping athletes, I think it was baseball players, I'm not sure, helping Barry athletes. Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, yeah. um, the, the uh, so, sprinter. Well, the isn't this the sprinter. same guy that helped them dope? That that's the first thing. Marion okay. Jones, and that doesn't mean he can't be on the right side of it now, <laughs> because you know he's reformed his life, he's learned, he's changed, life, and he is an expert on it. So you know, it's just like a guy who's a drug addict; he can become a drug counselor and and a great drug counselor because he he understood what it took to get off the drugs. He understood what it felt like. He understood what had to be done. So now he could be, he could educate himself. He could turn his life around. He could he could make different choices in his life and he could be a drug counselor. It seems like, let's give, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. That's what Conti has done with Vada, with his life now. He's turned it around. He wants to be on the right side. He wants to use that knowledge that he used for the wrong reasons. He wants to use it to clean up the sport. Okay, let's give him the benefit. Andy, Andy has Andy has a supplement company called Snack S N A C yeah. that sponsors a lot of fighters, and I believe he works with Devin Haney. But here's the thing. Bingo! That's what the fans are going to say. See that? I knew I'd get yep. you to do what I wanted you to do. If I just gave <laughs> you enough time, I moved you a little bit. Bingo! You did what I wanted you to do. You said it. He worked with Haiti before. Fans are going to say, oh, wait a minute. You got a guy in Victor Conti who used to work with Haiti, the guy that just lost to Garcia. He worked with Haiti. And he's the one who's in charge of finding a dirty test against Garcia? Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. We're supposed to not be suspicious or cynical? One, qu one quick thing. I don't know that Conti works for Vada. He weighed in on his opinion. He may consult for them, but I don't think he's an employee of Vada. Like, no, yeah, no, I don't I'm think he's saying, doing the I, testing. I, I think he was involved. Just to be clear. I think, I think he was involved with Vada, but you can look it up as I talk. But either way, he has put his opinion out there on in public it's been documented. I think I saw one of the, the tweets or something on the internet where he put his comments and his thoughts about and pertaining to this. All I'm going to say is once you get his name involved in this, no matter what degree it really is, Ken, you're going to have a lot of fans, a lot of people on the side of Haney saying, hey, wait a minute. The guy who's involved in this a little bit is a guy that also used to work with Haney. Isn't isn't that a little funny that, you know, we have to trust him now when he used to work with the guy that 
were, you know, is our adversary in this whole situation. So that's the first thing I want to say. Here's the second thing that matters. Ken, can we catch up to the 21st century? Can we catch up to other sports? Can we catch up to where it, it just makes sense that we can have testing for the boxes on a regular basis because there's no doubt there is a lot of bad stuff going on in all the sports but there's definitely some in my sport in boxing there's definitely it it is matter of fact we have an interview i think it's coming out next week am i correct is it next week or this week with tom hauser the great writer the great boxing writer is it i don't know if it's I think it's this week. this week. So it's going to be at the end of this uh, episode. Am I correct? That's right. I think it is. That's right. Yep. Okay, so listen to it if you get a chance. Because he talks about this. He talks about what... Uh, I think you asked him a question. Is is uh, PED use prevalent in bar? Yes, it is, he said. And you know what? I have to echo that. It is. But the testing is, is not up to up to par, up to what the other sports are. Um, obviously, Olympic testing. It is not consistent enough. I don't think it's at the level that it needs to be, and not everybody is tested. That's the problem. So there's a lot of guys out there that you wouldn't even know that that are, uh, your eyes might tell you that you're suspicious, but you wouldn't know in any kind of definite way because they're not even in the pool of being tested. We need to get the sport where everyone's tested. That's number one. Number two, can't we get to the place where the testing and the results come back before the fight? That's another thing that the fans are going nuts about. I don't blame them, Ken. Where they, they come out and they say, but wait a minute, Ted. Wait a minute, guys. You're going to tell me that he tasted dirty. He did look big. There's no doubt about it. Garcia looked big. He, he didn't make the weight, right? The whole thing. And and now you're going to say, which I'm not saying it's, it's not true. I'm just saying what people are going to, what their question is going to be. You're going to tell me that in such a significant fight, in such an important fight, you're going to tell me that we don't get the results until after the fight? Why did we get the results two days earlier? We got them a day after the fight. Why did we get the results a day before the fight? Answer that question. The, you don't get the... You, if you test the guy on Friday, the test might not come back till Monday. Those tests Why take you a test few days Friday? to run. Why test they, him on Friday? Why test him on Friday? I'm sure they tested him for the entire week and he passed every drug test leading up. But when he was cutting well, weight... What test? And Ken, lost like Ken, 10 what or test? 20%. What tests are good enough... Uh, are it has good to enough be, where, he has to be you, tested 365 days a week a days a year you have to be able to test guys in the off season but, but what you just said wait i'm gonna jump on this that, because i know this is what the fans are gonna say you said that he i'm sure he got tested during the week and he passed the test how's he passed the test if he's dirty how does he pass the test on thursday on wednesday on tuesday on friday how does he pass the test on those days and then there's fail a, it the, the day after how there there is a theory that when you cut that much body body weight and get that severely dehydrated to lose like 10 or 20 percent of your body weight that the that the substance in your blood in your system is more detectable in a dehydrated fighter which is why occasionally you get fighters that test positive a couple days after the fight but they haven't tested positive in the lead up to the fight because they're fully hydrated improve the testing improve the testing I I'm, go, I'm not way, let, I'm not letting go of this way. because there's we wouldn't have this it. we would not have this controversy right now if the we wouldn't have had a fight I get it but that's where people get suspicious too oh they do the testing afterwards because they don't want to blow the fight they don't want to blow the millions of dollars involved in the promotion of fight involved in the fight they everyone wants to get paid and then. It's okay to come out and say, oh, shoot, the guy was dirty. Because if you came out before it, you wouldn't have a fight. How do you answer that? 
Yeah, all I can say, all I can tell you is that he's they've they've both been tested repeatedly, and there is this theory that at a de- dehydrated fighter is e- it, the the drugs are easier to detect in their system. The only real way to catch people, if if in fact this is true, and he did this, yeah, then if, he was if doing we don't it, know, he was doing it before he entered the testing pool, and the only way to prevent that is like Olympic style testing, the way they te- test Olympic athletes, track athletes is by test, they enter a whereabouts program. You have to report your whereabouts online 24-7 every single day, and they can test you whenever and wherever they want because guys can do this like micro-dosing where they're taking drugs that the half-life is less than 12 hours. So as long as they take it, let's say, 8 o'clock at night, they have to come before 6 in the morning to test them for it with the current test that they're using. So there's other systems and other, I think there's other substances they can take to mask some of that stuff. But when you're dehydrated, all the masking agents, I think, are, are useless. And that's how guys get caught with these micro, like picogram levels of drugs in their system the day before the fight when they're severely dehydrated. That's, that's, I'm not a scientist. That's, that's how I read all the feedback. And by the way, Victor Conti never was involved with VADA. He allegedly provided some consultation to them. But to think that he could somehow get a dirty test in there for Ryan Garcia is like, yeah, okay. seems like no. a bit of a conspiracy theory, but I guess stranger things have happened. No, but his name, but we're correct. His name floated around Vada. He was involved consulting with Vada. He says he consulted with them, but he's also like a huge self-promoter. Um, but Vada says he has no involvement with them and had no but involvement he, with the formation of Vada. Okay, fine. But if he consulted with them, that's something, right? Am I correct? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's well, he, definitely, he definitely knows them. I don't know to what extent he's involved here. All right, let um, me... Let me let me ask this, Ken, because I know this is a big thing out there right now, and it should be. I'm not a scientist, uh, like Lex Friedman, the the great podcaster <laughs> that I, you know, he's a scientist, and and Physicist. and um and Rob and and Rob Biner's guy uh, who has that tremendous podcast. He's uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Rob Andrew who, Huberman. Yeah, he's a scientist. These guys are brilliant. These guys are like, forget it, uh, you know. And maybe they can figure this out. Maybe they can help us. Maybe they can. But there's got to be a way. And the reason why I qualify it saying, obviously, the obvious, I'm not a scientist, because I, I, I make it too simple. But you know what? Things need to be simple. And it's got to be a way to make things simpler where you will actually get the results of a drug test to make sure somebody is not drugging, somebody is not cheating. I mean, it couldn't be in a worse sport to do it. Baseball, so what? You, you, it's bad, but you, what do you do? You, you, you beat the crap out of the baseball because you got steroids in you, right? That's bad. Football is even worse because you're hitting somebody with a body that could have anabolic steroids in it. But boxing is the worst of the worst. You now have a fist that's going into somebody's skull that has freaking stuff going through your veins that is making that fist much more dangerous. You can't have that in this sport. It is a life and death situation. That is not being exaggerative. So it's got to be a way to find out is a guy dirty before he gets in a ring and punches somebody in the skull with that stuff flowing in his freaking veins than to find out two days after he punched him in the skull with that stuff floating in his veins when, when it's too late then. The damage is done. There has to be a way, really, to be able to do the testing that you're talking about that was done months before the fight, that was done weeks before, days before, and get the freaking results instead of a day after the fight, a day before the fight. My question is, do they want to do that? Is that a fair question? Do they want to do that and risk having a whole promotion not happen? I think that's a fair yeah. question. Yep. So as far as the only thing else I'm going to add 
from my point of view. I said it. I thought I broke it down the best I could. After the fight, I didn't think it was a put on. I still don't. I think Ryan had a lot of issues. A lot of stuff going on. That was making it very hard for him to get to this fight. A lot of doubts. A lot of demons. The devil knocking at the door. Whatever the fuck you want to call it. The, the terminologies that I use sometimes. A lot of stuff. And I think we all do sometimes. <laughs> We're scared of getting to certain things. Whether it's to go ask the girl at a prom. To, to the prom. To dance. Or, or whether it's to go ask your boss for, for a raise. Or, or whether it's go and... and 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 try out for a team in sports where you're not the best and you're afraid that you'll be you'll be told no and you'll be rejected, you'll be embarrassed, or whether it's to put your hand up in a classroom because you're afraid of you know that you won't have the right answer and somebody will make fun of you, or whether it's afraid of getting in a ring where you have a lot of reasons to be afraid. We all do. These are professional fighters, they deal with it. Ryan's a professional fighter. He's a terrific fighter. He was a terrific amateur. He deals with it. But that don't mean he don't feel those pressures. That don't mean he don't feel those doubts. And that doesn't mean that sometimes they get a little more intense than other times. I think he was going through a period in his life for this fight where those doubts, those feelings, those ninjas that come over the wall, that come over all of our walls, I think that they were coming faster. I think that it was getting, it was very difficult. I think what he was going through was was real. I don't, I, I think that it was, he was trying to find a way to get to this fight. And I think all of that stuff going on was part of his way that he went through to get to the fight. Now I'll finish it with this. If he did do something wrong and he did cheat, that was part of the way. That would be part of the way of getting to the fight. Of knowing that with all my doubts, with all this stuff going on, that this can help me alleviate some of those fears, those doubts. Stop some of those ninjas from coming over the wall that are attacking me at night, I can't sleep, they're attacking me during the day, that could be, that could be the one thing, or one of the things, that could help get me, that could help get me, to this fight, that's the way I look at it, from my, from my 50 years in the sport, where you do have to be a half a psychologist, and psychiatrist, if you're really going to be able to get results in this sport with fighters. It's more than just X's and O's. It's more than just speed and power. It's about what's going on up here. So I'm not, I don't know if he did or he didn't. All I know is what we're talking about is out there. And if he did, it's, it's obviously... It's obviously, I mean, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong. Obviously. Wrong for all the reasons I talked about before, the danger aspects of it, everything. Plus, it's, it's, it's cheating, it's, it, if it is. But, uh, again, I don't have any more proof than what's out there. I am just giving and lending my thoughts from my experience of what's the possibilities and what the possibilities of why somebody in that situation would do it, you know. Um, and look, that doesn't guarantee you're going to win just because you do it either. I I'll finish with that. Garcia still had to go in that freaking, he still had to go in that ring and face down one of the top fighters pound for pound in the world <laughs> and and do, you know, and do what he did and face what he faced. He still had to do that. But did he do it with that advantage and that edge? That's the thing we want to know. Yep. Well, 
Let's talk about the, uh, let's preview the uh, Loma Cambosos fight. And for our friends out there and listeners who may be considering betting on the fight, please go to mybookie.ag, use the promo code ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S, for a 50% credit on your first deposit. Again, go to mybookie.ag for all your wagering needs. Um, let's preview the fight, Teddy, and then I'll get your picks based on the uh, way the, the lines and props available. Uh, Vasily Lomachenko taking on George Cambosos. What are you looking for? What does each guy have to do to win? First of all, Lomachenko is one of the greatest fighters of all time. All time. He's a two-time Olympic gold medalist. He's a three-division world champion. He solidified all the titles, I believe, in, in at least one of his weight classes that he was the champ, uh, if not more. But he's a guy that is getting a little longer in the tooth. You know, he's a guy that, like I talk about Canelo. Canelo is, you know, he's getting at that point in his career where, you know, you've been around this long. It starts to show a little bit, a little slippage. I I thought he fought a hell of a fight with Haney. Really close. Really, really close fight. The only thing, I, I was ready to give it to Loma in that fight with Haney. The only thing was... It looked like he was getting to Haney late in that fight. Really did. And then all of a sudden, he took a round off, like the 11th. I can't remember exactly what it was, Ken. But like he had heard him in the 10th or 9th or 10th. And it looked like he was going to get to him. And then all of a sudden, he took a round off. It was like, what are you taking a round off for? You got all the momentum going. You need this round. And and that was enough for Haney, I thought, to eke it out. Um, in a really close fight that some people thought Haney won by a point, some people or a point or two, some people thought he lost by a point or two. But the reason I'm bringing that up is the older, the younger, I should say, Loma would not have taken that late, late round off. And when you start having to slow down a little bit or you start getting older, sometimes you have to make those concessions that you have to slow down in certain areas. Your pace, yeah, it's got to be a little bit more moderated. Canelo's is more moderated, his pace now. It is. And he's still getting the job done. I want to start with that. I think that this is one of the greatest fighters we've seen in our time, our era. And um, I think that he's slowing down a little bit. I think that he he cannot... He cannot go out there the way he used to with the motor running at the RPMs that it used to run at. It's got to run at a little bit uh, a, a different RPM now, a little bit of a lesser RPM now, but I think he's still a tremendous fighter. Um, I think that when it just comes down to the class of the fighter, and I like Cambosas a lot. We've had both those great fighters on our podcast. I, I like him a lot. I think he's better than people give him credit for. And he was a world champion. Here's the interesting thing. He beat Tiafomo, Tiafimo uh, Lopez. Uh, uh, am I saying it right? Tiafimo. Tiafimo Lopez, uh, yep. He beat him uh, in a huge upset, Cabosas. And of course, Tiafimo got his first title you know, made his bones, if you will, by beating Lomachenko. But I think Lomachenko is a different... And I, again, I think I think that Cambosis is better than people give him credit for. He's not a big punch, even though he dropped the Teofimo, he timed him well. He's a guy who's busy enough. He's a guy who's smart enough. He's a guy who can box pretty well. He's a guy who can also go and, and fight on the inside pretty well. But for the most part, he's a guy who likes to time you. He's a guy that likes to box. Lomachenko is a guy that can do anything. He can box on the outside, he give you angles, and he can go get you. Lomachenko at his best, he goes and he gets you by making you miss and then making you pay. He 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 is an aggressive counterpuncher. Roberto Duran was that when he was at his best. Yeah, a lot of people laugh. He wasn't a counter. Yes, he was. He was an aggressive counterpuncher. What is counterpuncher? It means make a guy miss and counter, whether you're going backwards or forward. 
as long as you're doing that. And that is what Roberto Durant did, and that's what Lomachenko does at his best. He comes forward, he makes you miss, and he counters right back, and he takes control of you. And he hits you, and he doesn't let you hit him. For the most part, that's what Loma, at his best, looks to do in a fight. I just don't think he can do it again consistently the way he used to round in and round out anymore. I think it's going to be a competitive fight. At the end of the day, I think class. And by using that term, I am not disparaging Cambosis in any way. I think I made it clear. I think he's a better fighter than people think. I, he's a good fighter. I am, I am not in any way disparaging him. But I think the class of the fighter is going to show. The, the thing, the question mark for me is how much does Loma have left? Because I do think, like I said about Canelo, that he's dropping off a little bit. There's no doubt. It happens. It's a, it's a normal part of getting older. It, it, it's, it, Father Time is undefeated. So I still think the class of this fighter, even getting older, even being diminished a little bit, I think the class of Loma will show and Loma will win a decision. All right, you want to you wanna hear the lines and see if this sways your uh, opinion here? Yeah. Give me one second. All right. So the line, the money line is minus 850 on Loma, plus 470 on Cambosos, over under. You got to lay big money on the over 10 and a half rounds, minus 360, under 10 and a half rounds, plus 238. You know what, Loma? Let me tell you something about Loma. He's not a huge puncher anymore. He never was huge, but he was a better puncher at featherweight. Then he moved up to lightweight. Now he's now he's uh, then he moved up to junior lightweight, and now he's lightweight. So he's not a huge puncher. Either one are. So knockouts is tough. But you know where you could get a knockout? You could get a stoppage if you want to take a little play on the under body. He's a good body puncher, Loma. Well, oh, here you go. Point. I was going to give you the uh, the props because you can take, if you like Loma to stop inside the distance, you can take Loma by KO and get 212 back on a $100 uh, bet, which is, seems not like really by good KO. Yeah, it is, okay. but I'm not taking him by KO. I don't know how. I, I, would, I would possibly think about, look, it figures to go the over, and I like Loma to win. Minus one, minus one ninety on Loma by decision. I'm, yeah, I'm not. Which laying is better that, than the I'm, minus eight fifty. Yeah, I'm not laying that kind of wood on a guy who's getting older. I just finished saying he's getting older. I'm not laying yeah. that kind of wood. Um, what I might do the fights in Australia, right? Yep, down under the backyard of the home country of uh, Cambosis. Is there a possibility it's a close enough fight that they give a, a favorable decision to the guy from down under? Is that possible? Well, you, can get, you can get great value there. Plus 840 on Cambosos by decision. I'm taking it. I'm, I'm, now let me make it clear because people have cotton in their ears out there. You know that, Ken. They don't clean their ears. So we, our fans, sometimes they're great, but they don't always clean their ears. Okay? So clean your ears a little. Use that little cotton stick, that thing, that swab, right? A little, and, and move some of that wax out of the way. I am saying that I like Lomachenko to win a fight, but we're talking about placing bets with my bookie right now. I would. I don't want to lay eight hundred, nine hundred dollars on Loma at this point in his career. I think he's going to win. Class is going to tell. It's going to come. Cream is going to rise to the top. But I am going to take a small play. I think it's a. I think it's a smart, reasonable play. A small play at how much of them are you going to give me for a decision for Cambosis? You're going on to give the decision. Me you're going to get plus. Uh... For George by decision, plus $840. All right, give me that. Give me a small play. Come on, small play. $50, $100, whatever. $50, whatever. Give me a small play on Cambosis. I'm saying it again. I 
think Loma is my man to win. But a small play at that, at home, in Australia, with a fighter who who is getting older, even though he's a great, great fighter, yeah, uh, I think that it's, I think it's worth taking a little play on Cambosis for that. And then um, it figures to go the distance. You got to lay a lot for the over though, right? Yeah, you got to lay 300 or something. Yeah, well, if you want to just say, will the fight go the distance? Uh, yes, it's minus 275. Or you could take the under, uh, over is over 10 and a half is minus 360. And what's under? Uh, if you want to get the under, you're getting plus 238 under 10 and a half. And will the fight go the distance? No, is plus 190. So, so again, take $20, uh, you know, that maybe you're going to spend on cigarettes. You shouldn't smoke, by the way. Smoking is bad. Very bad. Very bad. And cigarettes are about $400 a pack now anyway. So take the $20 or whatever it is um, and and put it on the chance that Lomachenko is going to land a nice body shot and maybe, or somebody is, and maybe uh, you're going to get a a comeback for the for the under. You're going to get a nice little comeback on the under, you know? But betting aside, odds aside, you know, all of that aside, what the lines are, props, I do think it'll go the distance, and I do think Lomachenko will win a decision, but I gave you my reasons for taking those plays with my bookie. If you want to have a little fun. If you can afford to have a little fun. Don't bet it if you can't afford to bet it. If you don't have extra money that, you know, is burning your pocket, do not, <laughs> do not, burning a hole in your pocket, do not go and bet just for the sake of betting. That's right. And if you are going to bet, please check out mybookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS. Teddy, that was a lot. We covered a lot of topics, a lot of yeah, fights. Um, looking forward to seeing this Loma fight, um, see what Loma still has in the tank. Um, but other than that, you got anything else before we say goodbye? No, just everybody be safe. Be, you know, everybody be safe out there. And um, we appreciate you all. Some of you are knuckleheads, but that's okay. I'm a <laughs> knucklehead too sometimes. So, you know, we appreciate you all being here. And we did this one uh, pretty thoroughly and a little, we try to do them all thorough, but a little longer because we're just trying to give you everything that you're looking for or that That's you might it. be looking for. That's all. That's right. Everyone have a great week. Please like and subscribe to the show on YouTube and we'll be back next week with all the action. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. And Teddy's going to introduce a special guest on today's show. Yeah, Tom House uh, is one of the most prolific boxing writers of this time. He's authored books on subjects ranging from boxing to Charles Dickens, uh, Charles Dickens Mark Twain, Beethoven, First time we've had somebody who's actually written on Beethoven on this show. Uh, his first book was made into the movie Missing, starring Jack Lemon and Sissy Spacek. He also wrote the definitive biography of Muhammad Ali. I wanted to take a second to just re read off that list so that our fans will understand exactly why I thought we should have him on this show to promote his latest book, my Mother and Me, which is right here. It's a, it's a really good book. I had the pleasure of reading through it, and it's a very interesting book, um, which would it entails uh, a lot of life stories, a lot of stories that are, are with us every day in whatever it is that we do, that we learn from our mother, and um, that helps form us later on for the fights that we all have, the battles that we all have in front of us. But I just thought that it would be a perfect Mother's Day gift, obviously. And also, I wanted Tom to be on here to tell some Muhammad Ali stories 
that were in his book on Ali and some that weren't, some that did not make the book. And our fan base will get the pleasure of hearing some of those stories. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Tom. Um, this, this book about your mom, it was not something that you only thought of writing after she passed away. You knew, and actually your mother knew, that you were going to be writing it. And she also gave you some instructions, telling you not to hide anything and to be honest, not to make her look like a saint and to put in the things that she had even done wrong. Um, <laughs> that that has my interest. I'm, I'm interested. So why did you write this and what do you hope that people take from it? This book was really my last gift to my mother. Uh, she lived to age 96. She had a long, wonderful, privileged life. And the truth of the matter is that 99.999% of us are completely forgotten 50 years after we're gone. You know, we might be names on a family tree. There might be some old faded photographs, but very few people know about their ancestors who lived 100 years ago. They're just names. And my mother, in addition to being a wonderful mother, I was fortunate to have had her for as long as I did, was a remarkable person. And I wanted to her to have this marker, which to me is much more appropriate than a headstone in a cemetery. Uh, so the book is partly a biography of her. I realized early on that I couldn't write about my mother and our relationship without writing about me. So it's also very self-revelatory in a lot of ways. It's about how relationships change because let's face it, all of us when we're young, look at our parents as our mother and our father. We don't really think of them as having independent lives apart from ourselves. But as we grow older, we certainly do understand that they have those lives. And ultimately it's a book about watching somebody who you love, grow old, then very old, and finally reach a point where they're ready to die. So it's something that most people, uh, they think about it, can identify with. It also tracks the changes in society that took place over the very long 96 years that she lived. And it was a joy for me to write. I didn't want to start writing my mother and Lee, me while my mother was still alive, uh, because that would have meant living each day with the shadow of her death. I thought I'd begin writing as soon as she died, but too much else was going on, you know, settling up her estate, the demands of everyday living. But when I finally sat down to write, it fro flowed freely. Uh, I'm very pleased with the end product and certainly you know, my email address is out there, and I can say it again now. It's thomashauserwriter at gmail.com. And I'd welcome anybody who reads the book you know, to email me. Let's share experiences, because one of the very gratifying things about this have been the, uh, the emails and letters I've gotten, not just from people who knew my mother, and some of them not even from people who knew me, but who read the book and said that it led them to think about their mother or their son in a different way. How can the people get the book, uh, Tom? What's the best way? Well, the easiest way to get it is probably go to Amazon.com. It's available in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle format. It's also available at BarnesandNoble.com and other outlets. Uh, it's out there, but Amazon is usually the quickest, most reliable way to get books. And if there's one story that you could share with us right now um, that you would think that would resonate with, uh, you know, with the people, just to hear, I mean, Mother's Day is coming up. Like I said earlier, it'll be a great gift for Mother's Day, but it's a great time. Well, every day is a good time to be thinking about your mother, but... It's obviously an important time that reminds us to think about our mother as we get close to that day on the calendar. What would be the story you would want to share right now? 
Well, for boxing fans, since this is primarily a boxing podcast, uh, not the most important story in the book, but there's the day... By the way, I... mothers are some of the greatest fighters of all time. But go ahead, Le okay. please. Okay, okay. Go on. Uh, it, uh, it would be the day that my mother met Muhammad Ali in my apartment. Uh, when I was working with Ali as his official biographer, he was in my apartment maybe a dozen times, and my mother, like everybody else, wanted to meet him. So I arranged for her to come over, and uh, you know, she came up, she rang the doorbell, Muhammad got up, and uh, she met him in the foyer to my apartment, and she looked at him and said, you're so much bigger than I thought. And Ali, being Ali, had the play, and he said, did you call me a, and then he used a word that's not a good word to use, <laughs> and, and rhymes with bigger. <laughs> you call me up. And she said, oh, I said bigger. <laughs> that, that's a good way to meet somebody. Wow. Coming towards her, pounding his fist into the palm of his hand. And I think at that moment, my mother could have been forgiven for thinking her life would have been happier and perhaps longer if her son had stayed a lawyer on Wall Street. And then when he was almost on top of her, Muhammad's face broke out into this wonderful smile that the whole world <laughs> fell in love with. Yeah. And he said, got you and hug you. And there's actually a picture of that moment on the dust jacket of the hardcover where Muhammad reaches out to hug my mother. And that was just a wonderful moment. That's a wonderful story. And, um, <laughs> That's a good one. Really, really. I mean, that, that, that really is. And um, that is quite a unique way to um, be introduced to somebody um, and for somebody to introduce themselves to somebody for the first time. What is your, as long as we're now touching on Muhammad Ali, what is your number one Ali experience during all the time that you spent around him while writing the biography? I don't think that I could choose one because it's like asking you, you know, what's the most wonderful moment you had with your kids or your grandchildren? I mean, there's just so many. And so at the one end of the spectrum, there are just extraordinary moments like sitting on the sofa in my living room and watching tapes with him of the rumble and the jungle and the thriller in Manila. And then there are moments like when we were in Jakarta together at the Grand Mosque and word got out that Ali was at the mosque and literally 500,000 people came and surrounded the mosque and the government had to send troops in to get us out, although they were interested in getting Ali out than me. And then there were just the, the wonderful times when, you know, I, I'd go out to his home in Berrien Springs where he lived at the time for, you know, five days a week at a time to work on the book. And there'd be moments when I got up in the morning and walked down to the kitchen and Ali would be sitting at the table and he'd ask, do you want cornflakes or granola? He would, you no, know, you met him. He was a very, very special man. And I don't think I'll ever have a professional experience that brings me as much joy as that did. And my mother said that meeting him was one of the memorable experiences of her life. She also got to meet Don King. <laughs> I, I brought her to a Don King press conference uh, about 18 years ago, it would have been, so I could write an article, my 80-year-old mother meets Don King. And I had set it up in advance with Alan Hopper, who did PR for King. And years later, my mother was in a restaurant on the Upper East Side of Manhattan where she lived. She walked into the restaurant and this loud, booming voice said, it's Tom Hauser's mama. And of course it was King. And the fact that he remembered her all those years later from one, that, that one meeting at a press conference, you know, he just, he had an amazing mind. He had an amazing memory. And he also understood early on, if you want to get along with someone, you get along with their mama. And you remember their mother, yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Aside from Ali, what fighter? I mean, I introduce you a certain way for a reason that you're, if not the top, but one of the top 
boxing writers of, of all time. And um, aside from Ali, what fighter was the most interesting that you found to write about? Tough one, because there are so many interesting fighters and they, they run the gamut. For example, I am enormously fond of Lennox Lewis. Uh, also Roy Jones. Uh, not only were they great fighters, I think they're outstanding individuals. Then at the other end of the spectrum, you have people like Mike Tyson, who I believe when he was young was a great fighter. To me, one of the sad things about Mike is that all the craziness has obscured how good he was when he was young. And Mike is fascinating to write about as well, but for reasons that are different than, than some of the other fighters we've just mentioned. Boxing is an incredible writer's sport. If you can't write well about boxing, you can't write. You were actually one of the first people I met in boxing back in 1983. When I began writing a book called The Black Lights, which was my first writing about boxing. I met you, Teddy. You've been one of my guides through this sport and business all along. And it's just an incredible journey. I remember I remember back then you coming to Gleason's gym and being there uh, every day for a while because you were writing about Billy Costello, who was uh, he he became the junior welterweight champion of the world from, from Kingston, New York. Yeah, I was researching a book called The Black Lights, uh, and uh, I needed a fighter to build it around. This is a book about the sport and business of boxing. And uh, I didn't want a superstar like Marvin Hagler or Ray Leonard, for example. I wanted a fighter who was a champion, who was to a degree in the limelight, but whose team had to work to get him a date on television. At that point in time, HBO and Showtime weren't, so you wanted to get on CBS or ABC. Uh, I don't even know if NBC was doing fights at the time. And Billy fit the bill. Uh, his stablemate was Jerry Cooney, uh, which gave me an entree into the glitz for when I wanted it. And uh, I said to Billy later in life, and this was after I had done the Alley book, I said to Billy and I meant it, I said, you'll always be my champion. And he was. Uh, Billy died young uh, from non-smokers, lung cancer. And it's really a shame because he was a good person. He had a lot to offer. He was a good fighter. And I should add, he was also becoming a very, very good ring judge. And we need more of those today in boxing. I, I, I remember, just as an aside, I remember watching a fight once on TV with my mother. I was over there. And the judge's decision came down. And my mother looked at me and said, what? And I said to myself, well, that's nice. Yeah, A woman, she was probably in her 70s then, you know, knows more about boxing than these three judges they're paying to judge the fight. Sadly, that um, that happens quite often. <laughs> and yeah. um, it is very sad. Bo boxing, talking about bad judging, uh, boxing had been, and I think part of it was bad judging, but it was a myriad of things. But boxing had been in the doldrums, um, being overtaken by UFC and the TV ratings. But recently, Saudi Arabia has stepped into the sport, putting together fights that otherwise would not have been possible. And that was part of the reason why it was in the doldrums, because, you know, with different promoters, you couldn't go to the other side of the street to make a fight that the fans wanted, that the sport needed. And now all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia has been doing that. If there was one fighter who could revigorate boxing, Tom, um, you've been around so many of them, uh, the way that Ali once did, the way that Tyson did, the way Sugar Ray Leonard did, Durant did. Who would you say, if there is such a guy, but who would you say would be that that fighter, that personality that who encapsulates everything that you have to encapsulate um, to you know to to get the public interested in the sport? Right now, despite the hype, I don't think there is that guy. And to me, boxing has two enormous problems. Uh, three, really. I mean, one of them is that people don't know who the champions are. Uh, 
there was a time when the heavyweight champion of the world, that was the most coveted title in sports. My mother could have told you who the heavyweight champion of the world was. It didn't have to be Muhammad Ali or Rocky Marciano or Mike Tyson. It could have been James Braddock or Ingemar Johansson. Now, if any one of our listeners you know, goes out on the street and asks 20 people, who's the heavyweight champion of the world? The answer you'll get most is, well, I don't think it's still Mike Tyson. Uh, you know, very few people are going to say, well, you know, Tyson Fury has this belt and Alexander Usyk has that belt. Uh, the sport now has an economic model that cuts most fans off from it. Tiger Woods never would have achieved the gargantuan fame that he did if you had to pay $79 to watch him play in the Masters. And yes, the Saudis are making big fights, but there are a couple of things about it that I don't like. Number one, they're putting them behind a paywall. So the average fan can't see them, either can't afford to or doesn't choose to pay for them. And then also, I know now they're planning to put a fight in Los Angeles and one in London under their auspices. But most of these big fights are in Saudi Arabia. And so it deprives somebody who has followed a fan from the beginning, followed a fighter, I should say, uh, followed a fighter from the beginning of his or her career. And the fighter gets to a certain point and all of a sudden that fighter is behind a paywall. They can't just get up and go to a fight because you know, the fights aren't in their cities anymore. And it, it, the whole system is starving out the club fights. And because so many elite fighters are waiting for that one huge payday, we see fewer and fewer good fights between good fighters. So I think boxing has a lot of problems, and it bothers me. Uh, you know, at, at the same time, uh, I just came across a quote. Uh, A.J. Liebling was talking about how, and this was in the 1950s, the fighter good as they used to be and boxing is good wasn't as good as it used to be and doc kearns the legendary manager who managed jack dempsey and after a while archie moore joey max and, and some others said what right do the writers have to complain in the old days they used to have better boxing writers and there's some truth to that too because we all know that the the state of boxing writing has declined in recent years there are some very very good boxing writers out there, but more and more the genre is being taken over by fanboys who are doing it to get clicks and they don't want to write anything that would put their uh, press potential or party pass in jeopardy. Well, even more directly, Tom, they're, they're writing what they're t paid and told to write by the promoters that are paying for their advertising on their website. Yeah, I mean, I really, I would love to see more independent voices like yours behind the microphone, because I remember you being behind the microphone, you know, for, for especially ESPN, but also NBC at times. You, you worked with Marv Albert in addition to a lot of other, you know, great commentators and some who weren't as good, but, but you, you always told it like it was, and I could always trust you and even if i didn't agree with you i knew it was your honest heartfelt belief you were knowledgeable you weren't some guy you know with blow dried hair who was made up for the camera you knew what you were talking about it you you gave it to us straight and that's what i wanted i don't know that people really want that anymore today and it's a shame that's why you have fewer and fewer boxing fans and, uh, you know, I, I, I miss it the way it was. And, you know, for me, the way it was, you know, might not have been as good as it was in the 30s and 40s, although we had some glorious times, you know, particularly in the 1970s when Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier and George Foreman gave us all a marvelous ride. Yeah, we sure did. Uh, Ken, please ask Tom some questions. Thank you for being so patient. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, Tom, very nice to meet you. Um, you you've written um, extensively about doping in sports in particular and um, as it relates to boxing. And I was wondering <clears throat> if you think 
like I tend to, that it's still extremely prevalent in the sport. I like to say that these tests at times, the doping controls are more an intelligence test than an actual drug test, i.e. they seem fairly easy to beat for some of the athletes. And what your take is on the current state of affairs with doping, especially in boxing? The use of illegal performance enhancing drugs in boxing is a real problem. There is one serious testing organization, and that's VADA the Voluntary Anti-Doping Association that's run by Dr. Margaret Goodman. They test, they test well, and when they find a positive, they report it to the appropriate authorities, they report it to both fighters camps, to the promoters, to the governing state athletic commission. Most of the testing organizations just sweep things under the rug, which is quite frankly what a lot of the promoters want. And really, at the end of the day, since most of the state athletic commissions don't understand the issue and don't really have the will to fix it you know, in, in the rare cases when they do, it is going to have to be up to the fighters in the end to step up and say, I want to be in a clean sport because you know, I'm the one who's getting hit in the head harder. It's not about who can run fast or who can hit a baseball further. The fighters are going to have to step up and do it because right now, a lot of the fighters feel they have to use illegal performance enhancing drugs to level the playing field. And, you know, I understand drug testing is expensive, but it can be done. And then, you know, the authorities have to fight for things. Because usually what happens is, you know, a fighter tests positive. They very rarely say, I screwed up. You got me. In fact, the only fighter I can think of who said that was Jarrell Miller after he was caught. <laughs> well, he was, time, but he to said, be, he well, to it. be honest, he was caught with about 10 different drugs in his system. It would have been hard to make up an excuse. But, but the, the, the fighters, you know, the fight, oh, oh, uh, uh, that, that something wrong with the test uh, or, you know, it was a supplement I inadvertently took. Or, you know, they, nobody ever fesses up and said they did it, which is why you have strict liability. And then the ones with money behind them put all these legal roadblocks in the way. And they say to people like UCAD or VADA or the British Boxing Board of Control, you know, by way of example, look. Either you play ball with us and let's find a middle ground where we don't really get punished, or it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees to defend against the lawsuit we bring and we'll bankrupt you. And that's tough. So the fighters really have to take the lead on this. I'd like it if the state athletic commissions would, but they don't. Uh, most of the athletic commissions, they, they, they're drug testing if they have it at all, consists of urinating in a cup on fight night. And, and the only people you'll catch then are idiots, because people understand, who know this stuff, that the real benefits you get from performance enhancing drugs don't come from their use on fight night or even the month before the fight. It's you know two, three, four months out before the fight when you're building up your core strength. But yeah, it's a real problem. And someday a fighter's going to be killed in the ring and it's going to come out that his opponent was using a performance enhancing drug. And then there'll be a big, big fuss, just like there was when Magomed Abdusalamov was, was critically brain damaged and his life ruined. There, the issue wasn't PEDs. It was substandard medical care by the New York State Athletic Commission after the fight. And there's a lot of hubbub and a big, you know, we have to fix this. And David Berlin was put in as chairman of the New York, or executive director, I should say, of the New York State Athletic Commission. And then David Berlin, who I think was an exemplary public servant, was doing his job too well. He wasn't doing the politically expedient thing. So he was removed from this position and Malvina Latham was put in his place. And then when or I guess David came after Malvina, excuse me, David was removed. And uh, then he, he, he was followed by somebody who, who was compliant. Uh, and now the commission in New York, uh, you know, I think, you know, looks very favorably on UFC and UFC's interests. And, does, you know, we just had a fight at Madison Square Garden 
on uh, Saturday night. Devin Haney against Ryan Garcia. Barkley and Center. Barkley. No, Barkley. 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 Stand corrected. Yeah, Dude, right. That's what happens when you get old. No, uh, no, and, uh, no problem. And, uh, Close and enough. Center, not a single commissioner was at that fight. Now, how are you going to be on the New York State <laughs> Athletic Commission and make policy when you don't even go to the fights? It seems like it's on brand for the State Athletic Commissions. And again, to emphasize, uh, David Berlin, who I think was exemplary, followed Maldina Lathan. Uh, and uh, again, I think he did a wonderful job, which is why he was removed from the position. I think that the, the, the one that you spoke of, I think it was Margaret Goodman, Vada, the voluntary anti-doping. The reason that they're the only effective one is, to your point, they're testing 24-7, 365. Because to your point, they no one's going to show up, only a, well, only a dummy is going to show up with drugs in their system on fight night. The real benefit is building up an endurance base and strength over the months leading up to the, before you even get into camp. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But thank you for that. And then also Vada, unfortunately, cannot test 365 seven, uh, except for fighters who enrolled in the WBC clean boxing program. Yep. Uh, the others, uh, the promoters of the fighters have to sign up for the testing. And then there's the element of cost because yep. serious drug costing is expensive. And Vada, except in rare instances, doesn't have the resources to test a fighter properly. So it's a little like uh, Margaret standing there with her finger in the dike and new leaks keeps you know, springing up and water coming out. Uh, but she's fighting the battle and she's fighting at heart and she's a fighter. I think one of the other challenges, too, is they can't test for certain substances until they know there's a substance that exists. So there's biochemists out there that are developing small variations of existing drugs that just don't show up. that are just different enough not to show up in the test. So until someone tells the doping agency, the anti-doping agency, that this molecule exists, there are drugs out there. I think at least that's what I've been led to believe, at least when it comes to cycling, that there are drugs that don't even have a test for, which is what was the case with EPO for many years. Yeah, the, um, the testers are pretty good now at catching up with the illegal drugs. The problem is, as you indicated, there's microdosing. So just because a fighter or other athlete tests clean on a given day doesn't mean that they're a clean athlete, because unless you happen to test them, you know, sometimes within 24 hours of when they ingested the drug, they're going to test clean, even if they used an illegal drug two weeks before. So it's tough. In, in a way, the, there, there are two deterrents to the use of illegal performance-enhancing drugs in boxing. Uh, one of them is, is the deterrent effect of saying, well, I might be tested. The other is that if somebody is caught, if they do test positive, there has to be punishment. And that's a second area where the system is really failing, because too often there are ways around it. All the people who are complicit in that system know who they are. <laughs> and by and large, the regulators know who they are, but they don't care. It sounds like the same thing we need in society, accountability. <laughs> we do. We do. And look, you, you had a father and I had a mother who preached accountability, which is one of the places that we got our values from. Uh, one of my concerns is, is that so many of the systems that society used to rely on to teach values, whether it was schools, you know, religious institutions, uh, parents, aren't teaching values the way they used to. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea of you know, how you think and the values you try to give to your kids. I know the values my parents tried to give to me. And in some ways, you know, our parents and, and you know, us are like you know, period pieces from some long ago time. Yep. Well, Tom, I, I really enjoyed this interview. I'm sure that our fans will enjoy it. I want to thank you for taking the time to come on and give these stories. But more important than just that, I want to just thank you for writing about boxing in the way that you do, in a straightforward, 
honest way that gives us a peek, not just into what is the obvious, you know, about somebody who's fast or somebody who's a better puncher who goes to the body, but gives us a peek into the insights of what the fighters are going through and what they must go through in their journey to become, you know, top guys, which everybody is trying to become. And also just to paint a picture where we can identify with the fighters as human beings, quite frankly. Um, Because sometimes people will think that a fighter is different than them in a way that, oh, they're a fighter. They, you know, they're, they're not... Uh, they're not attached to certain things that we're attached to as far as feelings and things like obviously it's it's quite uh, quite the opposite of that Uh, some of the fighters are the most sensitive people you're ever going to meet and some of them are the nicest people you're ever going to meet but sometimes like anything the image can become a poor image uh, from a you know from a couple and that image can be spread uh, throughout where some people don't bother to or don't have the ability to find out for themselves the truth. So you help us in that way by writing the way you write, by giving the stories, the real stories of these fighters. And you've been doing it for so long and so well. So again, thank you and go out there for Mother's Day. Uh, this this really, it's a, it's a great book. It really is. And I couldn't think of anything more appropriate uh, on Mother's Day. So, thank you, Tom. Thank you for for having me on your show, and uh, let's get together soon. In person. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Nice to meet you. Bye.